Ah, well, welcome everybody. I'm so pleased to invite you to this panel session uh, for ISOTL 2021. Today we have Elizabeth Lakey, Nira Raman, Teja Seti and Margarita Meza -Sona. Soma. I hope I've said those names correctly. Apologies if not. Um, we're so happy to have you here as our panelists today, all from the University of Melbourne. And the title for their panel today is Employability and Transferable Skills, Preparing Future HAS Graduates for the World Beyond University. Um, so thank you for all keeping your cameras off, except the panelists, obviously, just to save us on the bandwidth issues. And you're welcome to um, type your questions into the chat box as we go along. And the panelists may answer them as we go. Otherwise, we will have some time at the end for you to ask your questions. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to the panel. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Debbie, um, we're really, really pleased to be here. We're so pleased to see our wonderful students who both managed to get in as well. Um, and as Debbie mentioned, feel free, please, to to add any questions through the chat box. We'll have a look through and see if we can answer them as we go, or we'll come back to them at the end, certainly. So Nira and I are here today to talk about um, a really interesting and exciting project that we devised a couple of years ago. Um, and it was really about linking the skills and, and attributes and knowledge that art students have with what comes after university. So um, as we go into our first slide, we wanted to open with uh, an acknowledgement that students have told us and, and other staff at our institution have told us that there is a, a socially constructed stigma around arts and humanities degrees. We heard that from students very um, sort of loud and clear uh, around parents asking what are you studying this for or students feeling they need to justify to friends and colleagues what they can do after an arts degree. So we, we acknowledge that the uh, that humanities degrees are underappreciated um, and there's been some, some rhetoric around that, that that's not, not pleasant to us as arts academics, uh, which has really been um, has been hit uh, in addition uh, with the uh, the federal government recent federal government's most recent job ready package, which doubles the cost of a humanities degree and tries to steer students into other areas of study. Nira, did you have anything you wanted to add right there? Just to add to that point that often we all know that even when we were students, when you decided to study arts, you have to convince many people around you that why you are studying arts. It doesn't happen exactly the same way if you go to study engineering or science degrees. So that's where the stigma comes from. And, uh, you know, as uh, Elizabeth said, that the policymakers didn't make our life easier. So uh, <laughs> all this stigma politically and socially actually made Elizabeth and me think uh, probably th almost three years back, Elizabeth, when we started thinking about this, that how we can make it more uh, connecting uh, or uh, sort of uh, relevant to the uh, discussion and discourse within the society, right? Correct. Yeah. So we um, we wanted to connect with students, and actually, it, during the first, the very first lockdown that we had last year, um, and the second in Melbourne, and then on on and on they went, unfortunately for us. But in those early days, last year in 2019, we spoke to um, sorry 2020, I beg your pardon. Uh, we spoke to students about why they studied HAS. We did Zoom workshops and sort of pilot focus groups and just wanted to, to ask them, why are you here? You know, we know that there's the stigma, what's attracted you to the arts? And honestly, there were some really wonderful meetings because we heard from students that so clearly were motivated by passionate and inspiring academics in their field. They had such excitement to learn more about their discipline and had a real hunger to understand the world and their place in it. They often spoke about learning about different cultures, um, and to learn about what it means to be human and then also to make connections between different ways of understanding. So this is just a sort of a, a paraphrased list, but um, there was a real sense of pride and a real sense of, of hunger for knowledge and real curiosity in those meetings, those Zoom meetings that we had. And it was, it sort of bounced off the screen at us. And it was such a, um, you know, we, we've spoken about this stigma, but it was such a wonderful boost for us to, to see this hunger for knowledge from our students. And, and it, it left us sort of buzzing. It was a really great experience. And I'll add to that, uh, um, Elizabeth, that this discussion actually started late 2018, early 2019. Elizabeth uh, 
um, the thing Elizabeth is talking about, that's the focus group. But Margarita, you and Tejas will remember that we actually started this discussion when we started that student voice and agency platform within the University of Melbourne and started talking about within our Be Here, Be Heard space that and you guys were the first few people who, with me, started this discussion that why uh, we need to have this discussion. And Elizabeth and I started those formal focus groups or, uh, you know, the interviews from 2019. But the discussion actually started really, really robustly in 2019 when Tejas was in your second year, early second year and things like yeah. that. So, uh, it's it's few years long the discussion we are and having. certainly a, a very student led discussion. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we to, we to move in sort of to the to the real focus of today we 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 sort of listed and described that passion and we wanted to make a link for our students between this passion and then what comes next. Um, so it's around harnessing the passion that they have and what we want our students to really strive towards in the workplace. And we, for ourselves and our own teaching philosophies, have very clearly um, stipulated that we want our graduates to work in fields and organisations that align with their values and where they can make their best contribution. And what we're interested in doing is really looking at ways to combine this deep hunger for knowledge and the joy that comes with studying arts with the skills that we need to thrive after university. Um, now we thought uh, we thought against doing polls in this session just because we were not very comfortable with Canopy, the, the art platform. So what I've done is um, I've run similar sessions before with some colleagues in arts at University of Melbourne, and we wanted to ask people what is it that you enjoy about your colleagues? Why do you like working with your colleagues? What values do they have? What's good about working with a favourite colleague? And these are some of the answers that they came up with. And I wanted to put this front and centre because I believe that a lot of the terms here that come up are really values based terms. And there's not much emphasis here on LinkedIn profiles or networking or, you know, extreme technical knowledge, for example. A lot of the words here, I think, are really synonymous with the, the values, the, the skills, the attributes that you gain from studying the humanities. So just to situate that, we have these students who are, from one end, really passionate about this study and gaining knowledge in this field. And then we have colleagues and, and people, uh, a, a broad variety of people that we've asked this question to in, in the workforce, what do you value in a colleague? And we think there's a really strong connection there and we need to draw that out a little bit more, which is why we're here. Um, so here we're, we're talking about this connection. Um, we want to make a link and you can see from that student comment here on the, on the left in blue, it's so important to hear what the links are between our studies and the work that we might do in the future. And so here we draw now on what the humanities are, you know, our ways of perceiving, our ways of communication and aspirations for change and how these are really fundamental concepts and understandings about ourselves and they're useful in so many different contexts, workplace and, and other, otherwise in life. So in the, in the workplace, we call a lot of this soft skills. There's also a shift to calling them power skills, which is kind of cool, but I think more people probably understand soft skills. Um, and they're in really high demand. Uh, all, all the research shows that these are the skills that are in most what, what's being looked for in, in graduates. Neri, did you have something you wanted to I'll add? just add one point here that Elizabeth and I wrote one uh, article recently on the media, which I put the link in here uh, in the chat box. You guys can have a read through later around this, that connecting passion and profession and where we academics can come up and do our bit to connect that. And as I said, that um, that discussion is very much student led and our our sort of work within the arts faculty actually helps us really well in, in a way that I work uh, very closely with the student uh, in terms of the student voice and agency. Elizabeth works in the space of work integrated learning uh, and employability. So when Elizabeth and I work as a team, it's kind of we are bringing two different, you know, uh, aspects into that and that actually uh, summarize uh, passions and professions, uh, even for us as well. Nice one, Nira. <laughs> um, 
I've got a hand over near to, to lead um, some some questions for Tejas and Margarita. Um, this is certainly not the only time that we'll be calling on their expertise here and they'll be with us until the end of the session and, and we certainly welcome some more Q&A from anyone in, in the audience. But I, we just as a sort of a more formal part of the panel, Nira, um, over to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, choosing Tejas and Margarita uh, was actually a very conscious decision, as I said, that they have been with the Student Voice project for a very long time, and now they are just very recent graduates. So they are still in the uh, sort of space of recent alumni and working still within that Student Voice thing. And they were very part of this discussion when we started it. So I will just ask both of you uh, the first question that how well do you believe arts degree, the degree you have from the University of Melbourne, uh, prepared you for the live beyond university because I know that both of you are working now. So how can you connect it? So uh, Margarita, you first and then. Yeah, I'm happy to go. Um, thank you for, for having me and like it's so nice to be part of this. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the skills that were required of me as part of the, the job I do now, but also just in the like, you know, job hunt kind of process, I guess, are things that uh, were in a sense like never fully made explicit to me during my RC group, but like there are de definitely things that I built on in a sense, right? So some of these things are things such as adaptability, organizational skills, decision making, critical thinking, all things that sort of like I realized I had in a sense after I finished uni. Um, so I, I feel like like one important thing to say when when I think about being prepared as an art student is that I feel like there needs to be a bit of direction that's given to students to make the connection between the learning content and the idea of that developing your own skill. And I think this in particular should be made more explicit in our arts degree, if not within the subjects too that we do, I think. Great, great point. That just uh, First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, secondly, yeah, I agree with Margarita more, more so than that. Um, Coming from a South Asian background, my family was really not happy about the fact that I chose arts. Um, and as a result, a lot of my friends in Australia are not studying arts, they're studying commerce and science. So it gives me a good perspective into kind of that comparison. Um, one skill that arts degree taught me that I feel has been really essential in the workforce has been to critically engage with the literature, the subjectivity of our degree is the biggest strength that that we have uh the first semester i was in the uni one of my tutors taught me to print out the sheets or in any way have physical contact with the research that i'm doing so that i could underline cut and make notes while i'm going uh going through it um it did not make a lot of sense back then i used to be very unhappy about it uh, just as Claire mentioned in the comments, um, we pitched about something earlier, which happens to be super essential to our job now. Um, as an early intervention therapist who is delivering uh, research-based practices, it's really important for me to be able to engage with the literature, uh, not just see what's written and deliver it. I, to be able to make it client-centered, I need to engage with stuff. And that's something that I feel that arts degree did which no, uh, not a lot of other degrees could have done for me. Um, and yes, yeah, soft skills, like of course, um, writing. People don't understand how important writing can be. <laughs> uh, and with all the essays that we get to write throughout, the, throughout our degree, it's, um, it's a very good preparation for what's lying ahead for us. Yeah. Good point, Tejas. And so the next question I'll ask you first, because Margarita kind of started talking about that in her answer. But I'll ask you first that, yes, you said all the good things about it, and we all are very proud of doing those things. And, you know, uh, but is there anything missing in the arts degree in terms of preparing you, uh, you know, as a student uh, for employability? Because you are a recent graduate. Now, can you just do a retrospect around that? I find there's a lack of connection between literature and practical approaches. So while we are taught the concepts really well, um, at least in my experience, we won't really explain how we're going to put them in practice, especially as an undergraduate student, because it's uh, assumed that I'm going to study more. Um, 
I did a double major in media and psychology. So in media, I was really lucky. I found there was one subject which was teaching you how to pitch articles to newspapers. But in psychology, I studied for three years, six semesters. I didn't find one subject that prepared me for what I'm doing. Like in, in that they were giving me all the skills I required, but there was no practical aspect to it. Um, mm. So when I got to got to my job, I while I was going through stuff, while I was being trained, I, I realized, oh yeah, I, I learned that in the university. Uh, but it was it was um, not made explicitly known to me. And I was very lucky that I got an internship and then a job. But for someone else who isn't going through that process, uh, I don't think it'll be a very easy journey for them if they're not prepared for it. Yep, and that's something, Margaret, you were talking about. Can you just put a bit more light on that? Yeah, I think like like uh, like I don't like to. Maybe I'm the critical one between the me and Ted. Just, I tend to always learn out of that. Um, I think like personally, my undergraduate degree and just to give a bit of context, I did a double major in politics and international studies and Spanish and Latin American studies. Felt very distant from anything that was employability related, right? Like I, I didn't think when I finished my undergraduate degree that I was ready to go into the workforce, as we call it. But I, I think now looking back at it, I think maybe there was just something that I didn't think through. Like it wasn't, uh, you know, put in front of me that some of the things I had done, even in my undergraduate, were enough to get to to get me to the point where I was ready to actually, you know, look for a job and move into that space. So I think then I, I took a very different path in the sense that I, I decided to do an honors year, which to me seems like the most distant thing I could do to the type of job I do now. But now confronting these things, like writing a thesis is such like a good example of project management and like such a good example of like stakeholder management where like you're dealing with like different people you might be interviewing, but also your supervisor and all of that. And then I think I finished off my sort of study journey with a master degree in international relations. So I did study for a fair bit. I was definitely one of those people that was like, I feel like I need to have more knowledge to be ready. Um, and I think master's degree, master's degrees are a bit better at this in the sense that they, they, they are sort of aimed at sort of getting you to that stage where like you will leave uni eventually and go into the workforce. But I think there is a gap in also in that space and that relates to just the informal exchange of information around employability that comes from a cohort that particularly for master's degree it's very very diverse in terms of personal experiences and so having just discussion that really captured the background of students and teacher um like would have allowed a lot more in, in the classroom and i think a lot of my classmates had already had experience in the workforce and i only really made use of this after i finished studying and so i think those exchanges to like not just the formal like how does uni get you ready but just also like how does the environment of university get you ready to you know be employable yeah. yeah and i still remember having those conversations with you margarita and tejas many times focus groups and beyond focus groups and that actually led elizabeth and me you know doing this uh, uh workshop but uh, just to uh, sort of touch base with what you said, Margarita, the diversity, and even Tejas, you said your South Asian background and everything. So I'll just ask you the next question, which was really important for me and Elizabeth when we were kind of um, sort of envisaging or dreaming about the workshop, how we want to do it. So do you think that we actually recognize you as a learner and the background you bring in a classroom as a learner in arts classroom and if no why not if yes how much or it can be mixed mixed experience it can be totally negative experience but feel free and be critical margarita that's absolutely fine uh margarita over to you yeah i mean this is this has been my pain point since the beginning i i find it always a bit challenging as i do come from a very different background like Maybe maybe it's it's a it's a completely different background in a sense from what Tejas is, but like I'm I moved here from Italy, so I had a very different type of the way I structured knowledge and the way the way I learn and the way I express myself, and so I struggled a little bit with that in my undergraduate, and I think um, in my masters I started to have the opportunity to 
present some of the things that I had done, present some of my own background in a sense in the classroom. And I think that was really valuable for me, but I also noticed how valuable it is it was for other people. So I think I don't think that I wasn't recognized for who I was, but I think it needs to be it needs to improve, right? Like I think the good thing about being an art student is that there is diversity and so much more than in any other discipline in my opinion. And so the way we identify with arts and the way we come to arts is different. And so why not actually, you know, emphasize that and, and harness it in a sense? Yep. Mark, I just... um, I'll talk about it in more of a classroom sense. Um, and that's where culture can be a great power, but also the biggest um, thing holding us back. Uh, so in, I know this for a fact in South Asia, uh, active learning is not a thing. Uh, growing up, if I questioned my teacher, a, va a valid question, I wasn't really rewarded for it. It wasn't a very good thing to do. Uh, if I questioned um, if the stuff in my books was written correctly, or if I questioned if I wanted to know more about it, I was just told to learn the key points because that's what I need to put down in my exams. Well, that was one of the reasons why I decided to come to Australia in the first place. I had no understanding of how to engage in active learning. Like, it was like, I remember the first two semesters, like I asked my professors if I could go to the washroom or drink water more than I asked them questions about the research papers. And while I eventually got a hang of it, I think it'll be a good thing for the universities to realize that, especially for a degree like arts, where active learning is such a major component of what we're doing, um, that not everyone is equipped for that while everyone might be willing to do it that's why we are here not everyone is equipped for that so if there if there, there are workshops during the orientation period that the university could run for students um umbrella workshops really it could be really helpful um for people from different backgrounds because that is not to say that we're not respecting every background which make you know which is equipping everyone for the background that they're going to be dealing with now um yeah, that's my personal experience and yeah, yeah and that's why your both of you are have put such good light on to you know the experience and how important our background experience is as persons it's not only just the uh, what as they just you said that i didn't know about that it's not only just what you did not know about it it's even the thing you knew about which margarita might not know or something margarita might have known but you don't so it there should be an exchange and everything and that is something might be really connecting well with uh what we'll be discussing uh next uh elizabeth the next slide thanks nera um and thank you tedris and margarita i find it so fascinating every time i have these conversations with students just the the different the, the diversity, the breadth of experience that students bring. And I'm, I'm I'm always anxious and always looking for ways that we can recognize that better. So this is really what we set out to do. Um, and, you know, just as some, some thinking points now before we move into how we've designed our workshops and what, what the activities we've been, been going over the last couple of years, this is really what's motivating us here to think about how we can, can make these connections for students while recognizing what students are bringing into the classroom and and more for elizabeth i would say uh, empowering the students because often we say that all right we are uh, building graduates we are making graduates but the whole idea behind these university students are not only just teaching them subject content but also empowering them with the uh, viable workable and feasible skills so when we were doing this uh, you know, uh, the focus groups and things like that before designing that. These are the questions we looked at it. And Tejas and Margarita, feel free to say a couple of sentences if you think that if there is anything you want to add into these points uh, in terms of uh, how do you feel or was there any point of time when you felt, oh my God, I am empowered or I learned something which will work <laughs> better in my life beyond it? Okay, so our workshop series and then the way that we've we've approached this uh, is through a more formalised process that we've called Learning to Learn, Embedding Transferable Skills into Arts Higher Education. Um, and 
this guiding principle that we have on the right hand sorry not the right hand side the left hand side here about the onus being on us to articulate skills and knowledge to our students so they know what they've learned at university and how this will be useful moving forward into work and i think tedges and margarita have have spoken really beautifully to this already um so nira would you like to to sort of talk about this this yeah. process that we've developed yep and uh, from the uh, discussion we have had so far you all know that that students are eager and we are uh, we want to make, you know, empowered students and future ready arts graduate. But at the same time, as Margaret and Ted just said that, yeah, the skills, they didn't even realize when they were, you know, studying the subjects, rather they had to realize it later. All right, okay, I have done that. So as we said in the previous slide that the onus is on us. So when we were designing that workshop, we thought that just doing it for the students really wouldn't help. We need to have the conversation going within the faculty which will address the students their concerns their you know uh, skill building at the same time we need to involve in the discussion with our academic colleagues with our teaching staff who will be teaching those students preparing those students so when we started designing the workshop or even the framework elizabeth uh, the framework of the workshop we thought all right we'll do it in two ways so one will be student facing, another will be teaching uh, facing. But it's not exactly a very different workshop. It's kind of uh, holding the same, holding on the same thing, but at the same time, the audience is different. So one is the students making them uh, much more clearer about what they're learning and or or even equipped in the classroom, art subject classroom to know what's happening. So equipped kind of making them equipped for that and with our academic colleagues to make the students more equipped or you know discuss that more articulatingly Absolutely. in the place and that's where we thought the discussion just minutes before we had with Tejas and margarita that knowing ourselves is very very important and elizabeth and i when we started designing this workshop we thought that this is very important for our art students and even us as academics to know what are the strengths what are the weaknesses we are bringing in the classroom how we see ourselves as learner and elizabeth and i often talk about that that even as academics even as teaching staff we learn from our students every day so we all our learner every single day so what are the strengths we are bringing what are the weaknesses the moment we know that what are the strengths and weaknesses we are bringing in the classroom that will help us to decide what will be our opportunity or what would be the threats we'll be facing so this is very the workshop actually starts with the exercise we call it uh, personal SWOT analysis um, and knowing ourselves better and uh, next slide and that really really connects well with uh, the thing we were talking about that background experience and that is absolutely important because as we talked about that we want to empower our students so if we think learning as a power it can't just happen saying our students all right you know nothing from day one in our university you will start learning we need to really uh, sort of uh, value their background experience and I really love that student comment in the left hand side where it's saying that a background experience is more than an asset than a burden and it gives freedom and courage to make an input and when Elizabeth and I were kind of talking sort of structuring the workshop we thought all right personal SWOT analysis is fine but that will help us to think that what is the background knowledge we are bringing in what is our attitude towards the learning and even in this panel you can see that the way Tejas is probably looking at the learning Margaret might not might not be looking at the same way and gender plays a role our culture plays a role uh, you know the age uh, the way we grow up so it, it, it has got multiple issues around that so our background knowledge is very very important to make the connection with the competencies and skills we are learning for employability and the knowledge and often within arts faculty we talk about the subject knowledge but how we actually can connect the knowledge and skills that is very important and that's the key aspect of learning power and that's where Elizabeth and I were coming from. Correct. 
Yeah. So for us, then we really focused on as near as sort of spoke. You've spoken ahead a little bit near, but um, we were really interested in talking about who who students are and who we are as teachers and so our identity our positionality and our, our personal attributes and in doing so we found that having these discussions has really brought students out and, and um brought them to us and we try and be vulnerable in that space and we try and encourage a real honest discussion and to to really uncover what that means for our students as learners and for us as well as as lifelong learners and just to add to that point elizabeth that when we talk about the positionality and sort of you know personal attributes and everything we kind of for an example all of us as individual we want to showcase one part of our or few parts of our identity first before people notice the other identity so that is really connected to our strengths and connected to our weaknesses so elizabeth and i were absolutely uh, uh, sort of very, very uh, particular about creating a safe space within that workshop that where students can talk about their positionality or position their identity in that way. Perfect. Yeah. And so in, in going through this process. No, so, sorry, Elizabeth, we should talk about the previous slide a little more that uh, just one thing I want to add in here that um, Elizabeth will talk a lot about transferable skills in a moment, but when we actually do the teaching within arts faculty, as I was saying that we talk a lot about the subject content and everything, but the, as Margaret and they just beautifully said uh, that they, the skills are not really articulated uh, clearly within classroom. So we thought that, yes, subject content is there, overarching, but these five little, you know, the balls or flats or whatever you say, uh, that uh, those things are really, really important circles. It's talking about the individual experience. It's talking about the accurate skills, uh, sort of uh, graduate attributes, personal attributes and learning outcomes. We all have graduate attributes and learning outcomes for all the assessments and assignments. But do we really articulate that to our students? Students that what skills that is teaching to our, our students and that's where we were coming from now Elizabeth will talk a lot a little more about the transferable skills sorry for jumping ahead of you there. No, 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 no. um so we we landed on these these transferable skills and these soft skills that this was something that um has come up really often for, for me and some of the subjects I teach where students ask me directly you know what can I do with this? Well, you know, what, am, what, what, what skills am I gaining here? What is the point of this assessment task? Or what are we doing here? What can I use this for? Um, and you, I mean, I'm sure all of you are pretty familiar with the transferable skills and there are different ways of, uh, you know, naming them and sort of different ways of, um, of um, categorizing those, but they are really uh, very much around inter and intrapersonal intelligence and around communications. And I'm sure that Tejas in your work and Margarita too, with your really varied careers that you've gone on to would agree that these are skills that you're using every day. Um, and again, I'm just going to share a, a poll that we've conducted with our colleagues around those particular transferable skills and, and the importance that that they had, um, you know, to, to rank them and what was most important. And I think that what I really wanted to point out here from this slide was if you could cast your minds back to the previous poll, where one of those really big words in the word cloud that came up for people um, in terms of what they valued in a colleague was if they were creative. Um, and I think that really links to critical thinking up here. So I think there are these sort of links that are coming through with what we want in our colleagues and what we um, and what we can teach our students and how we can help them to to achieve those things and be, become warm and collegiate and um, valued kind of ethical colleagues that, that we want to work with. Um, so we, we would go through and, and speak with students and then ask them very, very simple questions like identify some skills that you know that you have already and can you think about where you might have demonstrated those. Some students are really capable of answering this question. Um, you know, some of them have got varied work history. For others, it is a real humdinger. They will sit there and think and they say, I don't know. 
I, I've done this, you know, I've learned this in my subjects, but I don't know, I don't, I don't know what skills I have. I don't know if I have any skills that are useful for the workplace. And then kind of drawing out a little bit more about their background and, and the rest of the students' lives and what they do outside of campus, either the room or the Zoom, um, we can uncover that a little bit more. And then we can move on to thinking about what are the skills you know that you're lacking or you know that you need to build on and to really encourage that conversation. And that's where we have, um, you know, sort of of what, what Ted just and, and Margarita explained around their diverse backgrounds and how they perceive knowledge and, and the way of organising knowledge quite differently. Um, and so people have different goals and different aims and certainly different methods of getting there. But even talking in this sort of language, talking about skills as well as knowledge for some students is this enormous leap. You know, it's something that they have might not have ever thought about before and it's a real, um, it's a kind of a game changer for some. I wonder if Tejas and Margarina have any reflections that they'd like to share there. I've just put I, I think I popped something in the chat, but I, I did I did say that um, I found that uh, you know like there was quite a lot that I had in terms of soft skills and transferable skills, and in the end, I think that was really what got me over the line. I think often when we finish studying, we think like, oh, I don't have this very specific skill that this job requires, because you know some of those are skills that you build working and that's totally fine like you can't develop everything in uni but like at the end of the day like it was more about my transferable and soft skills that got me over the line in my current job uh, than actually having some of those like you know hard skills and I think we um, we don't emphasize them enough and we just don't don't know how to express them and we also think that we need to have a specific type of work experience to back them up, but sometimes uni can give you that experience for some of those skills. One thing, yeah. was, sorry, they just go on. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I feel um, the hard skills that university teaches us act as scaffolding. So as soon as we enter a, a workplace, they do give us a lot of training. And the hard skills that university has taught us just make it so that it doesn't feel overwhelming and that it's all familiar, we've already studied it, but it's actually the soft skills that help us in our organizations. Um, and I know this for a fact because all of my colleagues that I either look up to or who are doing really well for themselves, I don't feel that they have very fancy degrees or anything. It's just that the, the soft skills that they have, their, their uh, ability to communicate, their ability to actually think on their feet, uh, and be creative when they're thinking on their feet as well. Uh, and the skills that university teaches us, like um, every essay that I've written has, I, this is the way I tell it to my colleagues, is every essay that I've written over the past three years has made me capable to write these reports. There weren't the essays about this stuff, but all of them have made me really capable to write objectively what I'm writing about. And these are the essays and these are the group presentations that I did, which allow me to interact with my clients really well and put the, put, put the points across. Um, I just, I'm thinking we should pay you as, you know, advertising ambassador <laughs> for Melbourne Uni <laughs> Arts Degree. And, and look, that really gives uh, us a good segue to talk about that. Exactly that's where uh, Elizabeth and I thought that, all right, how can we combine that, you know, the subject content and, you know, uh, the soft skills, the transferable skills more in a more articulate way. And we found that, look, we actually in the workshop series, we used the assignments, used an assessment task, used in different schools for different subjects, the existing one. And we actually got them and we put them with some questions. And in the workshop, we we actually worked in groups with our students that what do they think? What are the transferable skills they need to actually do that particular assessment or do that particular assignment? And that was really an eye opening experience for many students. They thought, oh, my God, I have never thought of that. But this assignment is actually uh, helping us. Uh, uh, to learn these, these, these skills or these, these, that skills. And that's where we uh, thought that uh, we can only celebrate arts when we can articulate the transferable skills better and better. connect the uh, discipline knowledge with the 
uh, you know, the uh, sort of skills, soft skills. And that is why we thought that, all right, we, when we are talking to our arts and humanities academic colleagues, we are not saying that you have to overhaul your whole program. Rather, just tweak here and there or, you know, uh, just doing it in a little different way can be really, really um, useful and that's how can where we I articulate really... what is most often existing in in the in the teaching in the subject delivery but to make that really explicit and um you know sometimes it doesn't involve quite a bit of change depends on depends on the subject depends on the person but often it doesn't so it's not a, a huge scary proposition um you know, i'm really conscious of the time for yeah i'll just answer. say just one wondering... sentence here that yeah in the chat box we actually put a google form for our academic colleagues here please uh sort of uh, get the link and uh, reply to it at any point of your convenience it's, it's just it's a very brief a, survey to yes. inform some further work that we're doing with our with our colleagues that would really really help us yes yeah uh, as, as we have well. a couple of slides which are just patting ourselves on the back now we've had some really good feedback from the workshop series and, and we're really proud of it so we're going to whip through those um but i think what we're seeing out of it is that um we're, we're able to make some of these things explicit for students to break these things down you know so um help helping to identify what might be an obstacle um how to verbalize how to manage a project how to break things down and, and achieve things in a different way or from what you might do at university or just identifying ways of, of describing this and speaking about the skills and knowledge that we gain at university and how that that takes us forward into the next steps which for many students is into the workforce um, so we've been really pleased with some of this this feedback um, and from that we've just got a, one or two slides of some really practical tips that we give our colleagues when they say what can I do right now what, what can I change you know without going through a whole process of changing my assessment tasks of overhauling my curriculum what can I do um, and just really clearly there I think the first one is so crucial discussing openly students' personal attributes, what they're bringing with them to the classroom, their background, um, who they are. And by the same token, when I'm teaching, I try and do that as well in a really honest way. And that, that sets up a really good relationship. Um, another thing that academics, some academics find difficult to do is to think about the transferable skills that are really well matched to our disciplines and to be able to discuss those openly and explicitly. Um, and I've got there as well to, to be really, um, really generous with praise and identifying things that students are doing well and say, you're very skilled at this particular thing. That's wonderful. So to, to draw that out and give them, to give them that language. Um, Neo, did you have any, anything else you really wanted to cover off here? Just very quickly, uh, both Margarita and Tejas, as I said, they were part of the focus groups or before that event. And we actually invited them to one of the pilots. Uh, so, Margarita and Tejas, if you want to add just your experience from those workshops, just very briefly, uh, whether Feel it's free. addressed. Yeah, go for it. I, I just think it was interesting to be in it where I was like, gosh, if I had been in this position a year ago, I understand how hard it would have been to actually recognize this thing. And now that you're you know, on the other side of the workforce and you've done all of those, like, you know, having to write your cover letters and assess, like, you know, responding to assessment criteria and all of that, it feels much easier. But having had a workshop like this before that would have made that whole transition less stressful for me. So I think it would be really useful for students. Uh, I felt that arts was a little bit of a vacuum before the program uh, in that it's such a diverse field. You don't really get to make that many connections if you're not actively trying to do that. Um, like I had people in my tutorial who were studying geography, philosophy, politics, psychology, uh, and there was a good chance. So the cohort experience is, is, is it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, with, with the diverse background, again, the, it's a good thing, but there's a barrier there as well. And the, I was always under the impression after 12 weeks, I won't get to see these people at all. Um, so it genuinely felt like a vacuum. Like when I say vacuum, when I was asked to introduce myself in my tutorials, I just, this once I genuinely thought I might as well just say anything and who cares? There's no one there to, you know, pick up on it. Uh, but with, with this, 
program and those workshops, I felt that there's that connect. And like that was my, my first experience of the sense of identity of an art student. And that was just so uplifting in itself. Um, wherein I wasn't just listening to diverse experiences, I was actually being uplifted by them, you know. I was actually learning from those diverse experiences. Uh, and that's what that was. I actually should be paid for this. Like, yeah. yeah. To, <laughs> but um, it was a very uh, wholesome experience in that. Yeah. Now, Tell we are happy you. to take any questions from the audience. <laughs> Either in the chat or if you want to pop up and ask. And I think maybe the students are kind of Tejas and Margarita, sort of, you're not students anymore, but you're the heroes of the day. So I suspect there might be some questions for you. <laughs> Claire, I see you have your hand up. Have you got a question for us? Yeah. All right. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's not so much a question, but a, a little bit of an observation. So I applaud the work that you're all doing because I think it's changing things for the better. Because my experience with an arts degree, so I got an arts degree in 19... <coughs> Oh, I won't be <laughs> it was a long time ago and it, I was unusual um, in the, my first two years I incorporated units from the science faculty and the commerce faculty but our faculty of arts would not let students incorporate those other faculties beyond second year so by third year you had to do units that were only available within the faculty and I went to the dean of the faculty because I rallied against this and I said no 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 I want to get an arts degree that's got units from all of the faculties why can't I do this and I'm going to paraphrase, you. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase the dean of the faculty at the time she told me that a, a bachelor of arts was less about getting a job and more about learning to think now, my teenage self at the time just lost all respect for academia at that point. But I, as a more mature learner and thinker, I can appreciate the message she was trying to give me. But at the time, I was going, what do you mean it's not about getting a job? I want to get a job after this degree. I don't want to be saying, would you like fries with that? Um, <laughs> so I think you and the sort of projects that you're championing is actually improving the situation but maybe it's not as different as it could be mm -hmm. i think claire right now we are really just i'm thinking of the way the pandemic has affected younger people really disproportionately um, and the way that work has been insecure for quite some time and it looks like it will become more insecure for for young people i think honestly we come up against um some very disciplined some some of our colleagues say this is not our job we have career services, we have, you know, people who are experts in this field, why should we have to incorporate this into our teaching? And I, I see the point, but I think we have a duty of care. And I think if this is our discipline and this is our knowledge base, we should know how to use this and how to use the wonderful, dis the skills that come with our discipline and realistically know that one, two percent of our students will move on into academia and we have to prepare them for, for what comes next. So yes, it's certainly, um, I think this is different from institution to institution, but um, I, I also applaud your younger self, Claire. I think that's pretty fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, I see you also have a question for the panel. Hi, thanks very much for um, your presentation and so lovely to see the students included and thank you for coming students. I think it's so important. Um, I've been working actually through ISATL with an international collaborative writing group and um, we've worked on a paper together talking about the T-shaped student um, and I put it I put the link in there I think I think the kinds of things that we're talking about are quite are quite similar um, and how universities need to you know stop and take a look at not just um, helping students with um, building a solid foundation of a disciplinary skill but also covering those um, soft skills and transferable skills as well and i think this fits very nicely with um with will as well and i think will in australia is, is quite a large thing and in canada as well and there's been a few workshops about that as well um over the course of these two days um, one of the things that I find really interesting and that that's made me think quite a bit over the last little bit is around culture and around the culture of relationship 
or, or the feeling of relationship with students uh, in different cultures. Yeah, so I always make a joke that, you know, my, I see my students in first year and um, I'm, I'm associate professor Edie and by last year I'm Michelle and then I'll be invited to your weddings. Um, and, and it actually happens. And, you know, I have a friend in Germany, a colleague in Germany or, or, or again, somebody in Singapore who says, you what? You know, you, you're friends with you, like your students get to know you in that way. They can count on you in a personal way. That's very strange. That's not something that we would do in our culture. Um, and it's really made me think about then, you know, is there a right or a wrong? Is there a chance of changing some of those cultural dispositions that are so firmly in, in place? Um, and can we lead the way from our perspective for other countries to, to see what it is um, that we feel is important? So um, I'm really excited about your work and I think it's a um, very valuable contribution. And so, yeah, thanks for your presentation. And Michelle, I will really, really relate to your uh, comment on that because Margaret and Tejas are here, but they often make jokes that they call me Mom Nira. So, uh, and uh, I sort of, you know, touch base with them at any time and they can do that. So it's, yes, it's relation building and this is really important. And that's what we were talking about at the beginning that knowing our students really, really part of empowering them. And that is often we miss that point that uh, that knowing is so important just to feel them that they really matter to us and uh, their their background matters or their cultural aspects matter and things mm -hmm. like that. So this is absolutely really important. And with Tejas, Tejas is here. It's so funny because still after three years, he calls me ma'am because he can't call me Nira. Uh, and uh, I totally, at, at some point at the beginning, I said, no, you can call me Nira. Now I know that that's where his comfort is and fine. So just that, you know, working around that relationship or bending to different cultures or getting to know different cultural nuances, which are really, really not, might not be huge, uh, you know, to flag and everything, but this yeah. is absolutely I, important to empower. I think it's really interesting just what you said too, just quickly, you know, I teach teachers how to teach and we have a quality teaching framework. And number one in that quality teaching framework is know your students and how they learn. And so why is it that we're not doing that at a university level? And how are we measuring how does this get quality lost? teaching? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's such so a I good think question. it would be very dangerous to be put in a room with you, Nira, because I think we could probably talk for a couple of days straight. I know. I was <laughs> just about to say that, Michelle, but I would email you and we'll be in touch because I have got many things to discuss with you. <laughs> I think also something to consider is how we can possibly make it easy for ac academics in this area to do this. You know, so perhaps producing some sort of framework or checklist or something that that is easy to implement, even if it's um, baby steps initially, just to get people moving in this direction. Um, and that could be really useful. Yeah, Debbie, I'm glad that you've made that point because Elizabeth and I are at this point thinking of doing some repository or you know some uh, you know you could call it a pack something like yes. that that you know which can yeah. help us to because we call our classrooms are diverse and we talk about diversity a lot but often we don't think diversity in a very diverse way we think it, because just elizabeth and i look different we are diverse it's not just our skin color it's not just our you know uh, accents or uh, hair color it's much deeper than that so yes elizabeth and i are actually planning to do that and that's why this google form is really really important to start the conversation you, at your convenience if you can just fill it up and please feel free to email us and we are happy to talk to you and get your uh, you know thoughts around it I know we're very pressed for time here, but I'd just like to make one final point, and that is I think academics are under a lot of pressure. We know that. I know I'm staring down the barrel of a lot of grading now. I know that things are difficult in the higher education sector right now. But um, in having these conversations with our colleagues, when we when we remember and emphasise that the students really are the reason that we're here, um, and when we talk about treating them maybe in the same way that we would treat our colleagues and, and elevating them in that way and making these connections and being warm and collegiate with them and knowing a little bit about them in the same way that we do with our, our colleagues. It 
it makes things in the classroom so much better. And so even it, it's not it's not doing a lot of extra work or, you know, yeah, there, there are pressures and there are so many things I do not love about my job, but I want to be able to leave all of that behind in the, in the classroom and say, this is, this is such a big part of why I do my job, why I love my job, and forging those connections makes the semester a wonderful experience. So that, that extra, that additional input and that really being there and being available, yeah, it might look like something else to do that you have to tick off on your list, but it's such a meaningful thing to do and it really brings great rewards. Yeah. Thank and you. going back to that point, Debbie, uh, Debbie uh, and Elizabeth, what you said that, you know, knowing you, even as an academic, even as a teaching staff, really would help to connect with others. So that's where it can start, that what's my skill and how I can get someone else to complement my skills and things like that. So. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That's, uh, this is such an exciting space and I really look forward to seeing um, how things move forward here. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you'd like to connect with anybody on the panel, you can find, you can message them through the, um, the speakers panel. There's a private message function there that you can use. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the panelists, especially, and for everybody to coming into the session and enjoy the rest of the conference.